Good morning, Hope Fellowship. My name is Michelle Boguslavsky, and my husband, Jeff, and I have been attending Hope for over five years. Um, if you'll please stand for today's reading. Our reading this morning is from Judges uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 15a. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Michelle. You all may be seated. That M facing out for everyone to see. Open up your Bibles this morning to Judges chapter 3, verse 12, as our dear friend Michelle just read, and turn to someone as you're doing so and say, get prepared. I would say that Mark made a mistake in giving me a passage that openly talks about poop, but here we are this morning, and it is a blessing and an honor to be preaching the Word of God to you this morning. So Judges chapter 3 verse 12 starts the same way as every other introduced judge starts like this, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Every time we see a new judge introduced, we should keep at the forefront of our mind the cycle of judges that is on display. One of the main things that Samuel the author is trying to communicate and convey here through the book of Judges is the cycle of belief and disbelief, allegiance to one and allegiance to another. And so the cycle is the same for every single judge and even the judges that aren't talked about in the book of Judges. Israel does what is evil. God strengthens an enemy to enslave or defeat them. The people cry out to God in desperation. God then hears their cries and raises up a judge or a savior. And then that judge defeats the enemy, bringing rest to the land for a certain period of time until, again, they start to do what is evil. Over and over and over again, it's the same cycle with the same group of people, just with a different judge. And our judge today is Ehud. Everyone say Ehud. Excellent. The story opens with the description of our hero and how he is going to basically save them or what he's going to save Israel with. It says, Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Ger, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, that's about 18 inches, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. We pause here, and we'll pause throughout the story to give some explanation, because whenever the Bible gives these small descriptive details, like left-handed or the length of a sword, it's important for us to kind of lean in and take note, because while being left-handed in today's society uh, may not be a bad thing, although I do feel like I have a lot of left, left-handed friends, and half of our staff is left-handed, and they feel like, it feels like they're constantly complaining about being left-handed, but that's besides the point. I don't want to make any enemies this morning, Uh, but it was much worse to be left-handed in ancient times. To be left-handed was to actually be seen as having a defect. You were defective if you were left-handed. You were viewed as lesser than. You, You were taken less seriously. You were treated differently simply because of the hand that you dominantly used. And so because being left-handed was so bad for ancient times, much worse than it is today, they attempted to hide this defect in any way possible. So they would either train themselves to be right-handed uh, or, or in, in, in cases like small cases, like if they were wearing a weapon, they would always wear the weapon, the sword, on the left side of their hip because that's where you naturally drew it out. And so for them, to wear it on the right side would be to give away the fact that they are left-handed. And so no one in ancient times would have worn a sword on their right hip because it would have screamed the fact that they were a defect. They were lesser than. And this is important because Ehud then takes this 18-inch dagger and he puts it in a place where he knows the guards and the advisors and anyone else who would have been doing screenings to come in to see a king would have never checked. And so him being left-handed, actually the Hebrew Bible saying, said that he's actually a cripple, uh, so his right hand doesn't even work, which really would have put all the guard down on everyone. 
puts it on his right thigh, allowing him to get in and bring this tribute to the enemy king named Eglon. It's verse 17. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. It's important to note, when the Bible says fat, it's not like if you go to Kenya, they're going to call me fat because I'm just a healthy weight. This was a big boy, okay? He was two offensive linemen put together. This is kind of what we are talking about. In fact, his Hebrew name kind of, well, one, Eglon, you say Eglon, and I'm already picturing a guy that's, you know, anyways. But his Hebrew name actually means little calf. So his parents were just doing him dirty by name. He must have been a chunky baby. Uh, if you need a picture maybe, and I think it's helpful for us, some historians have worked together with other ancient documents and texts to actually come up with a relative accurate depiction of what Eglon actually looked like. And I think we have it uh, here for us today. <laughs> roughly, roughly what he looked like. Just think fat, okay? He was fat. And this is important that Eglon is huge, okay? It is important that he is so big because Ehud plays to the king's insatiable appetite by bringing to him the one thing that he knows the king won't be able to resist, and that is food. It's a tribute. It's an offering. Here's all this food. I know you want to eat, big boy, okay? So Ehud's got his weapon. He's got his reason to get in and see the king. But now he needs a reason to get the king alone. Because if he just came in here and started stabbing the king in front of all the guards, all the soldiers, all the officials and advisors and all the servants, this is a suicide mission if he doesn't have another step in this plan. And so Ehud, in all of his cunning, devises something, uh, something to say to the king that he knows We'll get the king to get everyone to leave because he's not only playing to the king's physical appetite, but he also here plays to the king's fallen sinful appetite as well in his pride by announcing to the king in front of all his officials, I have a secret message for you, O king. And the king commanded silence and all of his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. He's alone with the king. He's actually gotten the king to bring him into his private chambers where there was a bathroom. That'll be important in just a second. He's got him right where he wants him. And then Ehud says the most James Bond, Bible man-esque line, I think, in all of scripture, which is, I have a message from God for you. It's like, I have definitely heard Bible man say that in my homeschool childhood. And instead of actually communicating a message, he pulls out the sword that's on his right hip and stabs it into this very fat, fat, fat man so that when he stabs him, it actually sucks in the sword, disappearing in this man. It's it's insane. It's verse 22. And the hilt also went in after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. This is the word of the Lord, infallible in all of its ways. He stabs the king, he explodes the king's colon, and the king poops himself to death. I mean, this, we cannot make this stuff up, people. This is in the Bible. And I get to preach it, you know? It's just like, I'm, I'm giddy right now. And there's a reason in all of this, okay? When you get stabbed, I've, I've never been stabbed, but I imagine it, it doesn't take... It's not a one-second death. It takes some time to die. And there's actually a reason that the servants don't come and check on him or even knock on the door to see if the king is all right with this enemy man named Ehud. And it's because they were embarrassed at the smell. They didn't want to embarrass the king and let him know that they knew that he was sitting on his second throne. And so they wait. For a period of time, because that's what you're supposed to do in these situations. If, here's some party etiquette. If you go to a party and you go to the bathroom and someone's leaving that bathroom and you smell something immediately, you should pause and wait. Because if you go in there right after them and you come back out and make eye contact with that person, they will know that you know what they just did in that room. And so it's etiquette, okay? This is helpful advice. 15 to 30 minutes is how long you wait. And so they are waiting because they smell something. Because it is something, but it's not what they think, but it gives time for Ehud to escape. And as historians have noted, and as we have discovered in archaeological digs how things were uh, structured and built in the city of Palms, they have concluded that the only place that Ehud could have escaped that would not have taken him past anyone to get caught was through the latrine, the sewer system, the toilet, okay? He escapes through a toilet 
which is a sermon in and of itself that we can't preach, that sometimes when God asks us to do something, it is going to be uncomfortable, messy, and stink. But he makes his way out, and he gets to his men, and he tells his men that they've won. They storm in. They kill 10,000 Moabite, able-bodied men. They take back the land, and they have rest for 80 years. This is the weird and graphic story of Ehud. And if you are, you have, Judges is just weird and graphic as a whole. And when we read this, we should laugh at stories like this. This story is in here partially to be comedic. It's supposed to be funny. But at the same time, when we're reading stories like this, whether it's in Judges or other portions of Scripture, a question should come up in us that is, what am I supposed to do with this? Why is this story in the Bible? What does a fat king dying by pooping himself out teach us about the character and nature of God? Are we supposed to view stories of Ehud or Judges or even when God commands a genocide in, in the Old Testament to be admired or celebrated or even, God forbid, imitate Ehud's cold-blooded assassination and their slaughtering of 10,000 men? I think the book of Judges, in all of its complexity, it forms bad feelings inside of us and causes more questions than answers. And so we avoid stories like this. We read over them and we say, oh, it's just a funny story and let's move on because we don't want to actually spend the time in it. But in the middle of this weird, wacky, and graphic story is an incredibly, incredibly important reality for us this morning about how God works in our world and who God uses to accomplish that work that he is doing. Ehud, bottom line, shows us that God works through unlikely people by imperfect means to carry out his perfect plan. It's how he has worked throughout all of scripture. He works through unlikely people by imperfect means to carry out his perfect plan. Could God here, could, could he have just snapped his fingers and everything be okay and they're delivered and they have rest? Absolutely. Could God in all of his power might make all things right in the world instantaneously? Absolutely. He has the power to do so and yet to do so would be to go against the free will that he has created us with and so God in his loving mercy and kindness accommodates himself to us and accommodates accommodates himself to our sin and accommodates us to our free will and uses essentially who we are with what we have in all of its imperfection. It means that we don't have to do it perfectly for God to be able to work it for his good and for his glory. It's a classic passage. God is working all things out for his glory and for the good of those who love him. Whatever offering we give to him, he is going to take and work through and make perfect because that's how God works. In the Old Testament, then, this looks like war on the wicked and holy war and instituting rules and laws and governments like Israel, which was a theocracy, in order to advance his kingdom's reign into the world. But in the New Testament, with the new covenant that we have, God works at a different way. It's no longer through violence or even legislation, but we advance the kingdom of God with a message. A message of truth that cuts through the lies, a message of hope that gives hope to the hopeless, and a message of life for those who are dead in their sin. Throughout the whole span of scripture, we are seeing different means to achieve the same end, which is God's perfect plan. David Brenner describes God's plan that we have in our life in his book, God's Will, and he describes it as such. He says, God is inviting us to work with him in advancing God's plan of displacing all the kingdoms of death and brokenness and replace them with his glorious reign. This is what Ehud is doing when he assassinates the fat king or when, he, when they kill 10,000 Moabite men. This is what we are doing. We're sharing the gospel and making disciples who make disciples. We are being invited to advance God's plan and kingdom by displacing the powers of death and darkness and replacing them with his reign. If you are a believer in the room today, if you claim that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then this is what our life should be strived for. This is what our life is now all about. It is a radical reorienting of every aspect of our life. It is a radical surrendering of every plan that we have to say, God, if it does not advance your kingdom, if it advances my kingdom instead of yours, if, if it's my will instead of your will, God, I will not do it because what this life is now about is, is, is advancing his kingdom by any means necessary. 
And we hear this, and we see this radical invitation to come in and displace all the kingdoms of death and brokenness and replace them with his glorious rule and reign. And instantly we either feel overwhelmed at the magnitude of this call or we get scared about having to radically live a new and different way that's different from the world around us, that has different values, that cares about things, that lives way more intentionally and is more aware than the world around us. And rather than making those radical decisions to accept this invitation by God, we reason our way out of it instead. For me, I naturally lean towards the inward relationship with God. I love the one-on-one, growing my relationship with him, to be known by him and to know him. I could sit in the word for a couple hours. I, it's easy for me just to sit in silence. It's, it's easy for me just to read books and learn more about who he is and what he is. That one-on-one personal relationship comes naturally to how I am wired But what doesn't come naturally is the social outward aspect of the faith. It's harder for me just to go up and walk up to someone randomly on the street and say, hey, I just want to ask, what's your faith? What do you believe? Can we have a conversation about that? Or I struggle when the Holy Spirit convicts me in a grocery store. Hey, that person needs prayer right now. You need to go up in an act of faith and pray for them. I struggle with all of those social outward things, even though I'm an extrovert. And so because that's what I struggle with, Rather than accepting those invitations to get uncomfortable, I've reasoned my way out of it in those moments and said, well, it's just not how I've been wired. Someone else will do it because that's how they're wired, but I'm not wired that way. Maybe you use that excuse or maybe you use other ones to reason your way out of it. Maybe it's, I just don't have enough time. I'm so busy to stop. I know that's probably a 30-minute conversation, and, and i got to keep going and keep doing this thing, or I just don't have the time to prioritize that. i got other things that are in my priority list, or that's not my spiritual gifting. You know, theirs is evangelism, sure, but mine is study. I, I'm called to just study. You know, I'm called to just read the word, and you know, essentially it's a, somebody else will call 911 for them. I, I, I don't have to do that because that's not my spiritual gifting, or I need more training. I'm not quite there yet. I, I don't want to be more hurtful than, than helpful. Or, or the, the all-time classic that makes me feel really good is I'll pray that God would reveal himself to them quietly behind closed doors without anyone watching. All important things, all not necessarily bad things, all probably honest reasons for why. But while those may be true, about us. Maybe we maybe evangelism isn't our spiritual gift or maybe we aren't completely trained or maybe we don't have enough time and we are busy or maybe that's not how we're naturally wired. None of those are valid reasons to not do what God is calling or commanding us to do because throughout scripture we see that God uses unlikely and imperfect people by imperfect means to carry out his perfect plan. And what Ehud does is it gives us three major lessons in the midst of this crazy story. It gives us three major lessons on who God uses that shows that he works not through the perfect, not through the well-trained and equipped, but he works through the weak but willing, the intentional and prepared, and most importantly, he works through those who simply have faith. The first, weak but willing, If we look at Ehud, he is not the strongest person and probably the most capable person to go save Israel. There were stronger, more capable, more able. There were people with two arms to go save Israel. He was a cripple. It wasn't just that he was left-handed. It was that he wasn't, it was that he was unable to even use his right hand. But it's that very reason of being a cripple that even allowed him to probably get past the guards or to give the king enough confidence to be alone with this guy because what's a one-armed person gonna do against an 800-pound elephant of a man? What Ehud probably saw as a weakness most of his life, God uses to accomplish his will. Paul reiterates this truth in 2 Corinthians to the church of Corinth, reminding them in verses 9 and 10, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's not about what you can or can't do. It's not about how good you are at something. It's not about how trained or equipped you are. It's about if you are willing to do it. One preacher said, it's not about ability. It's about availability. 
Someone has got to be willing to do the dirty work. In this story, both literally and spiritually. Someone has to be willing to risk their life. Someone has to be willing to put their life on the line for the kingdom of God in order to defeat God's enemies, advance God's kingdom, and bring rest to his people. I think about the infamous passage in Isaiah 6. Eight, Jesus, or God is asking, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And there's a voice saying, here I am. Send me. Friends, God is not looking for the strongest people. He is looking for those who are willing and who are saying, here I am. Send me. And while it's not about our strength or our equipping or our training throughout Scripture, we also see that God uses those who are intentional and prepared because oftentimes what we train for and what we pray, uh, prepare for and what we're intentional with shows how much we actually care about that thing. We're not going to put in all the time to prepare for something if we don't actually care about it or if we don't think it's real or if we don't think it's true or if we don't think it's important enough. If we look and we really dissect the story of Ehud, we should just, you will find an intentional plan that Ehud has devised. He did not just walk in here willy-nilly saying, I'm trusting in the Spirit, hope this all goes well. No, he made a specific tool for a specific purpose. He hid it in a specific place where he knew guards wouldn't look because he understood the culture and the context. He knew exactly what would get him an audience with the king. He knew exactly what would get the king alone and send everyone out. He knew exactly where to stab the king to do three things. One, to clog the wound instantly. One, because he was fat, but two, because the sword disappears and clogs it. So that blood doesn't leak out and spill onto the floor under the doors alerting the people that the king has been stabbed. He stabs him specifically in the stomach because if he's punching it with that much force, the wind is being knocked out of him and he's not going to be able to scream or alert. And he's punching the sword in in such a place where something is happening internally so that something comes out externally because he's in a bathroom where he knew that the king was going to bring him and he knew the servants would probably not bother them because they thought that he was using the porcelain throne. This is not some just haphazard plan. This is a, I have detailed this out. I know what I'm doing. He is a cunning assassin to the point where he's even got an escape route. Preparation is important in our faith. I think of the disciples with Jesus. He doesn't call them from a boat and send them straight on their way to do those things. No, he for months asks them to follow him, to watch him, to ask questions. He gives them uh, access that no one else has. He answers parables. He explains parables to them that he doesn't do for other people. He is working with them and discipling them so that they can have the confidence and preparation, the confidence in their preparation to go out and do what Jesus is calling them to do. God is not calling us to carry out this advancing of his kingdom by the flying by the seat of our pants without any preparation or training or intentionality. We should be growing ourselves. We should be meditating on the word day and night. We should be we should be equipping ourselves by doing what we're doing here today, not just for a one-on-one relationship with God, but so that we can be more equipped to do what's actually important, and that's advancing his kingdom. It's a great opportunity coming up October 21st with uh, Discipleship Pastor Matthew. And he's going to be doing a four chairs training, which will give you an understanding of how to uh, be aware of and meet people with whatever spiritual season they're in and then how to disciple them to the next one. If we really care about this, we will be doing preparation and equipping for these things, the intentional and the prepared. But out of all these, the most important, I think, lesson we see in Ehud is that God uses those who simply have faith. Not a lukewarm faith, not a, it was my grandparents' faith, not a workspace faith, but as Dallas Willard, a writer and professor and profound thinker, says, we don't believe something by merely saying we believe it, or even when we believe that we believe it. We believe something when we act as if it were true. The genuineness of our faith is shown in the works of our life. James 2, faith without works is dead. 
And we can proclaim Christ all day long that he is Lord and Savior. I can actually believe that. But if I'm not actually doing the things that Jesus has commanded me to do, if we are not following his ways and living radically different as he calls us to live radically different than the world around us, then my faith is one that is not genuine and we have to come to face that it might not be a genuine saving faith. Do we trust God enough? Do we actually trust what he has said? Do we actually trust that when he says, I am coming, be ready? Do we actually trust that enough to actually put action behind it? God works through the faithful, those with this kind of faith. And this kind of faith is not easy. And the primary reason for that outside of sin is simply because of idols. Things that we prioritize and place our trust, our hope, our happiness, and our worth in besides God. And idols are all throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Judges, and we see them to be, at its core, shiny, attractive, readily available objects made in our image that numb us from seeing the goodness, the beauty, and the worth of God. That's important. Idols, they're not just things on a shelf, but they are things all around us that we place our trust, our hope, our happiness, our comfort, our worth in, and they numb us from seeing the goodness, the beauty, and the worth of God. Idols destroy faith because they turn our attention and ultimately they turn our devotion and allegiance off of God and onto ourselves or onto things that will all eventually burn. And the list of idols could go on and on and on. The idols of sex, and we're just chasing after that next release. The idols of sports, whether we're spending 30 hours watching them, or we're spending 30 hours putting our kids from, or entertainment, and we're binging office episode after office episode after office. I'm speaking to myself here, and, and man, I, I am just wasting away precious minutes and seconds and hours upon hours watching Steve Carell do something stupid and entertaining, or our phones. Our phones have become an appendage of ours so that when we leave them in another room even, or when we're more than 10 feet away from them, we start to to feel like we're missing a part of our body. So we get things like an Apple Watch that allows us to stay close to it so that just in case someone needs me, they can reach me. But in reality, it's just going to be another. My mom sent this morning a weekly panorama image. Here it is. I didn't know that we were doing that as a family, but Cass, I guess we're putting every week a panorama image in our phone but that's the thing everything becomes the most important and that all of a sudden becomes elevated in our lives our food and we're eating to numb pain or we're eating to make ourselves feel better or our spouses our children success time money if I can just have x amount of money then I'll be happy then I'll be secure then I can really take it easy and start getting some rest More and more and more, all these idols and more make us short-sighted and caught up with the immediate now rather than caught up and viewing the world through an eternal lens. Idols erase. As Jonathan Edwards said, he wanted to have eternity written on his eyes so that everything he saw, he was remembering that what really matters is not these things, but it's him, his glory, and his kingdom. And throughout the book of Judges, the author Samuel is simply just trying to show us how stupid it is when we place our faith in an idol by essentially making fun of those who put their faith in an idol. Again, look at this story. It is comedic for a very specific reason. And that reason is that Samuel is trying to say that idols create Idiots like the king who places his trust in them to save them and for his comfort and for his security. And he, his end is laying on the floor with poop coming out of him. Idols create idiots. The Bible says it, not me. Isaiah and Jeremiah both say that, they might, that, that the only thing that idols are good for are wood that is burned for fuel. Paul says that idols are demons everywhere the Bible is trying to just pound into our spirit that idols create idiots and lead to death. Idiots are those in the book of Proverbs called fools who care more about this world and who invest more in this world. They are the people that Jesus says store up treasures on earth where things can rot rather than things in heaven. They're the people who have made the gifts 
better than and who think the gifts are better than God himself who created and gave those gifts. The idiots are the Israelites who are cyclically falling away. Idiots are the Moabites who somehow let an assassin come in who was a cripple and kill their king. An idiot is someone who was so motivated by his desire for more power that a secret message could only be heard by him and eventually led to his death. And this is the reason why Israelites needed a judge at the book of Judges. This is why we need a savior. Because we get caught in this cycle of belief and disbelief and devotion and apathy over and over and over again. And so what we see God doing in the book of Judges and how we know God to work in our life is that he provides a pressure on our life that purifies our attention and our devotion. It is a pressure from God. In Revelation 1, 9 through 11, Jesus is address, addressing the church of Smyrna, who is experiencing intense persecution. And what he says to them is, I know your tribulation. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. He doesn't say, I'm removing this from you because you're my people. He says, do not fear. Trust me, you are going to suffer, but do not fear what you are about to suffer. The word used here for tribulation is thalipsis. It means pressure. And Daryl W. Johnson in his book, Discipleship on Edge, a fantastic book on the book of Revelation. If, it's, if that book has always been confusing to you, I would really encourage you to read that one. But he explains this word and pressure that God provides in our life as the pressure experienced as the kingdom of God comes up against the kingdom of human beings in rebellion against God. The pressure experienced along the line where kingdoms clash, the line where the kingdom of light clashes with the kingdom of darkness, justice clashes with injustice, the rule of life clashes with the rule of death. The pressure experienced when idols are unmasked, where human pride is confronted with a call to repentance, it brings us to the bottom line essentials, to Jesus himself who is our only security and only hope. God, in his loving mercy, by any means necessary, is trying to bring us to a place where our bottom line essential is only and is completely and comes from completely Jesus. And God will do whatever it takes to bring us to that point because only when that is true will we have the actual trust that is required from faith. We can complain about that truth. We can, we can say it's mean, and that's, that's all good and well. You should pray those things to God. Pray how you feel to God. That's really important. Don't cover it up. But at the same time, what we have to realize that's being conveyed here in the book of Judges and the story of Ehud and throughout Scripture is that God knows something that we frequently forget, and that is that 70 years of pruning and suffering that leads to an eternity of peace, joy, and love is better than 70 years of fleeting happiness, cheap sex, and a comfortable life that leads to eternal suffering. Only when our devotion and our obsession and our attention and our allegiance and our love is set on Jesus completely will we have the kind of faith necessary to fulfill the call of God and advance his kingdom. The story of Ehud ends, I think, in a beautiful way as he comes back from the assassination attempt and he proclaims to the Israelites in Judges 3, verse 28, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. They go down and they kill those 10,000 Moabites and they secure rest and peace for 80 years. And the interesting thing is that they went from complicitly doing what was evil for 18 years. 18 years they are in bondage and slavery and they are under the rule and reign of the Moabites before they even cry out to God, before they get desperate enough and turn to God. 18 years and in this span of one story, They go from complicitly doing what was evil to confidently destroying that evil in one story. What changed for the Israelites? What changed is that their faith came from God, not from 
what they could do. Their faith came from what God had already done instead of what they could even work to do. I think this brings about a very important thing. The Lord has given. He has given. It's past tense. The enemy's into your hand. The work is done. All that they have to do is go. It's important to note, it's not that God does all the work for them, but that the work is done so that if the Israelites when Ehud came and proclaimed this to them, would have stayed on their butts and not done anything, they would have stayed in bondage. That's important. In God's sovereignty, he has secured their battle. He he has won it into their hands, but they have to have a faith that doesn't just say that they believe or that believes that they believe, but they have to have a faith that actually acts as if it were true and go. I think of the crippled man in the story of Jesus when he says, take up your mat and walk. What would have happened if he didn't do that? The work is done, but we have to respond in faith, trusting with actual steps that the faith is, that the the work is done. The Israelites won because they had a faith that when God said it was won, the battle actually was won. They had a faith that was built up from a place of victory. This is the kind of faith that wins battles. This is the kind of faith that actually advances the kingdom of God into the world through us broken vessels. This is the faith that produces a surrender in us to act and live and love differently. And we don't have some left-handed assassin accomplishing this for us. Friends, the work has been finished. The war has been won. Our salvation, our rest is sealed by him and through him and for him. We have peace and joy and life because of him. And it's not because of anything that we have done. It is all because of the death and resurrection of Christ. If God can use a crippled, left-handed assassin or a sex-addicted Nazarite that we'll learn about in a couple of weeks or a reluctant farmer, we should gain some confidence that it's not about who we are, it's not about what we can do, it's not even about how faithful we have been. It's about right now, where is your faith placed and are you willing to act on that faith? Because if we actually trusted God, if we actually trusted everything that he says in here, if we actually trusted him enough to obey, if we actually trusted him enough to do these things that he is calling us to do, our life would look different because we would be wholly surrendered and devoted to him, not seeking out and grasping for control in our own life. It's a life when we have this kind of faith that looks radically different than the world around it because we care about a lot smaller of things. We're more intentional with smaller things. We don't let our kids do certain things or do certain things on certain days of the week. We wake up early and we lose some sleep in order to spend some time with God and orient our day around him to start. We, we prioritize things. We spend our money differently. We, we're more careful with what we watch and what we listen to and what it's forming in us. As Christians, it is a radical reorientation around this thing so that every aspect of our life We are working on just surrendering it all to God as to say your way is better. God, your joy is better. Father, your plans for me are better. Father, your desires for me are better. Father, you are better than anything in this world. And because of that, all that I am is yours. Here I am. Send me. I, 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 man, we, we beat around the bush with, with a lot of these things, but today I just want to draw a line in the sand and say if you are living half in and half out, if your faith is not really your own, if your faith doesn't actually cause you to look different or live different than the world around you, you have to ask the question today, is my faith actually genuine? And then you have to ask, what are the things keeping me from actually acting differently? What am I placing my trust in besides God that's not allowing me to do what God is calling me to do? What am I placing my hope in besides God so that I I care way more about what people think of me right now than just being fear of the Lord and caring that God loves me and that's enough? What am I placing my comfort in? What am I placing my values in? What am I placing my life in that is causing me to, for some reason, not trust God enough to live the way that he's calling me to live? We have to ask those questions because, friends, our life is not our own. This life 
is not about making our will and our kingdom move into the world around us. Our, our life is not about getting enough money and retiring at a certain age and having a fun life and raising up great kids. And our, our life is not about having a healthy marriage. Our, our life is not about any of these things. Those are results. But our life is about one thing and one thing alone if we claim Christ as Lord and Savior, and that is advancing his kingdom by displacing the rule and reign of death and darkness. And we've got to get uncomfortable with that truth enough to start actually asking honestly and answering honestly in our hearts, what am I unwilling to surrender? Where can I just not follow you, Christ? And then we do as the Israelites did, and we repent. And we turn to him. And we trust him enough to go and win the battle. One psalm that I have turned to frequently in the last six months, in moments of anxiety, in moments when I can feel that desolation in me, that my attention and fixation and devotion has turned from Christ and onto myself or something else, and so that's why I'm feeling anxious, or in times when I've just not known what to do, or in times when I've just felt overwhelmed with life in general, I've turned to Psalm 46. And I would just encourage you for a moment to just get into a heart position and a soul position, a physical position, to just receive this proclamation of truth. It's Psalm 46. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, because of that truth, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, look at, fix your attention on the works of the Lord and what he has done, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. From minute to massive, this should be an often and frequent reminder for us. Be still. Follow me. The Lord has given the enemies into your hand. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Come to me, all who labor, and I will give you rest. Be still and know that I am God. Your baby's keeping you up through the night. Be still and know that I am God. Your, your job isn't, isn't providing for you what you thought it could provide for. Be still and know that I am God. Your marriage is on the rocks. Be still and know that I am God. You're concerned about the future and if it's going to work out how you want it to work out, be still and know that I am God. You just got a C minus on an exam. Be still and know that he is God. Be still. Stop and simply rest in the victory of Christ. This was the faith that enabled Ehud to risk his life. This is the faith that he imparted onto the Israelites that just made them actually move for once and repent and go and do what God had set him to do. This is the faith that we can have because of the work of Christ, a faith from victory that is completely surrendered to and resting in his finished work. So as believers this morning, as Mark, I'm even remembering what Mark said a couple weeks ago about remembrance, the practice of remembrance should be something we take very seriously. Building up a practice of simply stopping and doing nothing should be at the priority list on our minds as Christians. Something that reminds us every single day that I am not in control and that even when I stop, the world goes on. Maybe it's 30 seconds of silence in the morning where you're reciting one thing, be still and know that I am God, or, or come, Holy Spirit, have mercy on me. One thing. For Start where you're at, 15, 30 seconds. 
where you are just reminding your soul that you are not in control. It's not about your will. It's about his will. It's not about your kingdom. It's about his kingdom. It's not about your plans. It's about his plans. It's not about what you can do. It's not about how often you go to church. It's not about how many times you read through the Bible. It's not about what you can achieve or accomplish. It's not about what what somebody else is doing. It is simply about what Christ has done. And as Christians, we should remind ourselves of that frequently so that we don't go out and try to win something that's already been won for us. Be still and know that he is God. Trust that he actually is our refuge and strength and a very present help in times of trouble. Get confidence to actually move and act differently because of it. There is a line in the sand today that we have to make the decision to cross over. Am I going to live radically different and start walking on this path or am I gonna continue to toe this line or at that point, if you don't cross it, you're just walking away from it. Faith is not faith if we aren't living, acting, and loving differently. Be still and know that it's him, not you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that it's not us. I thank you that you work through, in Ehud's words, the crap of our life to accomplish your perfect plans. I thank you that it's not about how good I am up here. It's about what you're doing in hearts. Thank you that it's not about how much we can do for your kingdom. It's about how much we're willing to surrender to your kingdom. Father, I thank you that you hold tightly and securely our souls, my soul. That you are a present help in times of trouble. I thank you for the testimonies in this room of people who have trusted God and who have built up a well of remembrance in them so that when pressure hits they know that you are God. They don't doubt what you can do. They don't doubt what you will do, but they are just resting fully and completely in your fulfilled promises. Father, for those who are sitting on the fence, for those who are towing the line, for those who are walking away, for those who are living no differently than they did before, accepting you as their Lord and Savior, would you just push them, move them, Apply pressure on them by any means necessary so that their allegiance, their devotion, their attention, their obsession, their love would be completely and totally fixated on you and only you. Father, for those who are so numbed because of idols, in the name of Jesus, we cast off those idols. In the name of Jesus, I speak against those idols. That is numbing your beauty. That is numbing your glory. That is numbing your worth and is making them think of you way less than they should be. In the name of Jesus, I speak against those who are doubting that you are good. In the name of Jesus, I speak against the lies that are saying that you don't actually love us and you don't have our best intentions in mind. In the name of Jesus, I speak against the lies of the enemy who say that your plan might not be the best plan and we should start maybe creating some backups and some B and C plans. In the name of Jesus, I speak against the lie that we are in control and we control our destiny and I pray in this room by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, I pray that this would be a room filled with surrender. I pray that this would be a room filled with decisions of surrendering God. My money is yours. God, my marriage is yours. God, my future is yours. God, my desires are yours. God, my plan is yours. Father, move in us and create a pressure on us to make these decisions that lead to life, not just for ourselves, but life for those around us. Make us a people who care more about your kingdom than our own. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you have mercy on this place this morning? Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there. 
so that more people have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.